Welcome to the Frugalpreneur Podcast. I'm your host, Sarah St. John, and my guest today is the founder and CEO of Miller IP Law, which helps startups and small businesses with copyrights, trademarks, patents, and more. Welcome to the show, Devin Miller. Well, thanks for having me on. I'm excited to be here. Well, can you give the audience a little of your background history and how you got into this field? Sure. And it's always the simplest questions to get the longest <laughs> answers. So I'll try and keep my background history a bit more concise, but yeah, so a bit about myself. So I've been doing intellectual property, patents, trademarks, copyrights, and other uh, business related stuff for about nine years. So I've been turning for about nine years, but probably backing up just a bit before that. So I got, ended up getting four degrees, which my wife always jokes is three degrees too many. I got a undergraduate. I went and got an electrical engineering degree as well as a Chinese degree in Mandarin Chinese. And then when I went to graduate, I kind of had had two passions. I loved business and kind of being an entrepreneur and startups. So we saw that was very fun and exciting. I also thought the legal aspect of the law was kind of fun and exciting. So as I was graduating, I was really trying to decide what I wanted to do. And rather than do one or the other, I decided to be both. So I ended up getting both a law degree as well as an MBA degree, master's in business administration, and kind of have taken that as the, the path throughout my whole career. So I had started a few businesses, started one while I was doing law school and MBA school and started a few sands. And so I just, I love both the idea or the side of being an entrepreneur and doing startups and small businesses, as well as helping other startups and small businesses to protect their intellectual property. Wow. Four degrees. I, I don't know if I've met someone who has four degrees and the one with Chinese or Mandarin, I'm curious about that. Where'd you get that interest? Yeah. So really, I don't feel that it was interest in a, of my own. It was, so I served a religious mission for my church, Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, or otherwise known as nickname of Mormon. So I served a religious mission in Taiwan for a couple of years. So I did a year of undergraduate, took a break off when served a religious mission. While I was in Taiwan for that couple of years, they speak Mandarin Chinese as well. So I picked up the, the Mandarin Chinese as a language. When I came back, decided to continue study engineering. Decided I just do that as a double or as a dual degree to study both of those at the same time. So nothing overly <laughs> glamorous. It was more just of a, I figured, Hey, if I've already learned the language, I might as well continue to learn it for a bit. Wow. That's awesome. I, I think a lot of people are get confused about the differences between like copyrights, trademarks, patents. Can you break down the difference between them or in what types of situations you would need, which one for? Yep, absolutely. So. Quick overview then. So I would start with what is a lot of, there's sometimes you'll hear intellectual property and I'll probably say, and sometimes you'll hear others say it, intellectual property at its very core is kind of, if you're to think of just like what it sounds, it's really property that isn't tangible, it isn't physical. And so it's intellectual, something that's in your mind, something that isn't physical, but you nonetheless has values. And so within intellectual property is kind of an umbrella term. They have three things underneath it. You mentioned patents, trademarks, copyrights. So if you're thinking of kind of the easiest breakdown of patents, trademarks, copyrights, patents are going to be for invention. So if you make something, you create the next best iPhone or the next best widget, you do software and you create something that's new and awesome software, anything that's more on the inventive nature is going to be on um, a patent. Trademarks are going to go more towards a brand. So if you're to think of the name of the company, a name of a product, a logo, a cash phrase, anything of that nature, anything that's really associated with the brand falls under trademarks. And then the last one is on copyrights I and mean, copyrights are going to be more on the creative side. So if you think of, you know, if you're doing something that's kind of creative and a creative work, so a book, a movie, a podcast, a sculpture, a painting, a photo, you know, photograph, anything that kind of has that creative nature to it, that's the way you protect with copyright. So which one you need is depending on what your business is doing. And sometimes you have multiple things. Hey, I'm creating a brand. I'm also creating a product. You may do both a patent and a trademark or Hey, I'm writing the next best book or next best book series, whether it's John Clancy or Harry Potter or Lord of the Rings or whatever your favorite book is. But if you're doing that, then it's, you know, under copyrights and also going to have some branding with trademarks. So that's kind of how you start to break those up. And so basically they all protect from someone else using or creating something using the same name. If it's a trademark or claiming ownership yeah, I mean, to a book or. Yeah, there's kind of two reasons why you can get any of them. One is, is it more of a defensive and or offensive, but really going after or protecting somebody from taking your hard work when that can be, Hey, I put a whole bunch of R and D research and development into creating an awesome new product. I don't want somebody to copy it, ride my coattails, and then I don't make the money very much. Same thing with the brand, same thing with copy, you know, write the next best book. You don't want someone just copying that, selling it as if they were you. And so one of that is going to be more on the 
protecting, you know, what you've done. The other one I always look at is also more of an asset. In other words, you know, there is, if you think of great brands or products, but let's say Apple or Nike or Amazon or Starbucks or, you know, M&Ms or whatever, they have a great brand. Some of them like Apple have a great product. And so it's also an asset that they're saying, not only is it for protection, but now we actually say we own this brand. It's investable, it's licensed. You know, you think of Disney, they license a whole bunch of their brand to other people. So it's not just for defensive purposes, but it's also an asset of the company that you can use to create real value. And I've heard, and I don't know if this is true, so I'm curious, like when you write a book, for example, or a song or a poem or something like that, that just writing it gives you an automatic copyright. Is that true? Yeah. So that would be the one exception. Pats and trademarks are not that way. In other words, with a little bit of an exception for trademarks, really, unless you file form, unless you protect or file and, and get them registered and, and protect that way, there isn't a lot of protection there. Copyrights. You do by putting it in a tangible meaning. In other words, you can't keep it in your head. It's not copyrightable, but if you take the photo, you write the book, you take the, you know, film the movie or whatever, you do have some inherent rights. You have ownership to what you've created. Now, if you ever go to enforce it, you're still realistically still going to have to register it. And because one, you'll be there to force enforcing court to get really any compensation or damages, it has to be registered. And two, a lot of times the reason that you'll, you'll still register it, even though you already have some of those inherent rights is. To get a demarcation, hey, at least by this date, I took the photo, I wrote the book, I took the film. And so you're not having a question of who created it first. Does somebody else do it first? Somebody else not do it first. So there are inherent rights by just creating it. You do have ownership to it. If you're really wanting to have the, the full protection and make sure everything's in place, you'd still get it registered. Okay. And then another thing I've wondered about fair use, like if I'm doing a blog post about a particular software that I use and recommend, and I put their logo in the blog post so that it's recognizable and, and it kind of sparks attraction or versus just the word, like to have the logo, I think is more appealing, mm -hmm. but would that be, I mean, cause I'm sure the logo might be trademarked or whatever, but when you're using it in that form, would that be going against that or? As with all great attorneys, if you ever want to know what, uh, if you're talking with a real attorney, just ask him a question. I'll always give you the answer if it depends. So there is a bit of, it depends, um, but I'll give you a bit more of a context. So a couple of things, when you're looking at fair use, you don't want to pass it off as you are somehow associated with the product. In other words, you don't want to say, you know, you use their logo and people think, oh, they're a distributor or they are part of that branding or, you know, something affiliated. Cause that will generally, if you're using their brand to better your brand or using their logo or that to create an affiliation or create an association or misguide people that can create an issue. Now, if you're just basically saying, Hey, I'm doing your review, that one a bit depends. I mean, if you're purely doing your review and saying, let's compare two products, you do have some leeway. You have to make sure to do it right. And so it's hard and it's probably a harder one to get into on the full show, but you do have some ability or leeway to within fair use to do a product comparison or to show it's something side by side. When you get into the logo, they do have inherent rights to control how you use a logo. So you do have to walk a, a bit of a fine line as to if you use it right and you deal with comparisons, generally you're okay, but you also have to be cognizant that you don't own the rights to that. And if you don't do it the right way, they can come after you or you can get in trouble. Yeah. Or like on a resource page where you list different products that you use and recommend. And that's a pretty common thing for entrepreneurs to do. You, you, you do want to do it. I don't want to give people just that, Hey, if I'm doing a comparison, <laughs> all is well, don't worry about it. It's all for fine. Do a little bit of research just to make sure, but generally, as long as you do it reasonably and you're not trying to pass something off, you're not trying to make some, give me the impression and you're not doing anything derogatory with their brand that this as they're saying, Hey, you're, you're devaluing our trademark for a brand. You're generally okay. Yeah. Cause I mean, you think as long as, yeah, you're being positive and saying, and you're recommending it that if they get more business that way, well, I mean, why would they have a problem with it? But who knows? Stranger things have happened. I'm sure as far as trademarks and patents, how much do those usually cost and how long do they take to get them? Yeah. So all of them are pretty variable copyright. I'll, I'll do all three copyrights, patents, trademarks, copyrights are fairly straightforward. I mean, to do a submission is, you know, flat fee of our flat fee is an example is, you know, $350 to file it. And generally once you file it, there's not a lot of examination. It basically gets filed with the library of Congress. It takes a, you know, to get it 
filed is going to be a, a week or so to hear back from them that it actually got registered and it's, everything is completed. Trademark is a bit more involved than or as far as that. So trademarks usually run around eight, 850 or so. If you're to have an attorney do it up anywhere from arm wear 850, you can go upwards of if you're at a big LA firm or a big California firm in New York, some it might go up to 1500, $2,000. But you know, if you're to do that's kind of your cost, usually you're looking to get a trademark as long as you're trademarkable term, you're probably at about nine months, nine to 12 months, somewhere in there to get through the full process to register the trademark for a patent application that usually is going to run you at the full process. You're probably like, if it was with us, with our firm, it'd be 11, $12,000 over the course of a couple of years. If you're to go to a large law firm, you could be $20,000. And that usually takes you about two years to, from the time you file. I know when I watch Shark Tank, sometimes they have multiple patents or they keep referring to utility patent. How do you know when you need more than one patent and what types and why would you need more than one? A couple of things, if you were to take Shark Tank, and I love Shark Tank, by the way, I think I've watched every episode. If I haven't watched every episode, I've only missed one or two. So me and my wife always watch it on Sunday nights. I started watching it for years and then I said, hey, you like the show. So we started watching it together. You, if you're listening to Shark Tank or other ones, there's going to be kind of three general terminologies you'll hear. One is utility application or design pen. So utility is basically kind of what it sounds like functionality. If they normal patents, most of the time when you refer to patents, if they just say a patent, it's going to be on the utility side. It's functional. It does something. It accomplishes something. It isn't, you know, it's not just pretty, it doesn't just look nice, but actually it does something. That's going to be a the utility patent. Design patent is going to be more of the aesthetic nature, the look and feel to a product. So if you were to think of, you know, iPhone, iPhone has a, it used to have a little circular button before they got rid of it. It has the curved edges, how, you know, the shape of the phone, that's a design patent that they have that for the aesthetic look of the phone. They also have utility patents for how the touchscreen works, how the battery works, how the antennas work, and they'll have multiple patents. So that's kind of the first thing to break down between design and utility. Now within utility, the other thing you'll hear, and sometimes on Shark Tank as well, is they'll have the difference between what they'll say is a provisional and a non-provisional or full patent application. Provisional is basically a less expensive one-year placeholder application, doesn't have all the formalities, hasn't been examined at all, but you're kind of saying, I have filed this, I'm patent pending, I have a year to decide whether or not I want to actually do a full patent or not, and I'll save my place in line. That's what a, a provisional is, and then a non-provisional is going to be a full patent application. So that one kind of has gone through, we'll go through the full process. Yes. How do I know if I need one or both? And that really is going to vary based on the business. If you're really more of a aesthetic nature of look and feel of something, you may just need design patents. If you've got something that has both a cool look to it, as well as a utility, you may need both. And then a lot of times what will end up happening with a lot of companies is they're going to build a portfolio and that's where you refer to as multiple patents, because usually you'll have a great idea and you're going to go and you're going to change the world. Everybody always thinks they're going to be millionaires that all you have to do is have that one great idea and then you'll get into it and you'll find out, okay, now I've had that one great idea. I start develop it. We filed a patent on it and then we do generation two or three and I figure out how to improve it, make it better, expand the product line and all those additions. Then you start to get build patents around those to protect the ongoing innovation that you're doing. So a lot of times you'll have a family or a portfolio patent over time as you continue to develop the product and the business. So with all of these, obviously I'm sure the copyright, the trademark, the patent could get denied or declined. What reasoning would there be, I guess, if something else exists that's similar to it already or? Yeah. So copyrights usually don't get denied unless you mess something up with the filing. And the only reason you typically get denied with the copyright is if you'd copied someone or you stole it from them or you, you didn't otherwise create it yourself, that's the only typically the reason you wouldn't get a copyright. There are other exceptions to the rule, but that's generally what we'd worry about. Trademarks are going to be, so if you file a trademark, they're going to look at it. They're going to examine it for trademark ability. Their standard is basically going to be, is it confusingly similar with any trademarks or already out there? What does confusingly similar mean? Well, means with somebody that, you know, a customer that's out there, would they see your brand and would they see somebody else's brand and think it's the same company or not know who is selling what goods or think, you know, somehow they're intertwined. And if that's the case then you can't get a trademark for, for something that somebody else already owns because it will confuse the customer. So that's generally why you're going to get a trademark rejection. The other reason you'll a lot of times get a trademark rejection if it's what's called merely descriptive. So give you an example. If you wanted to go start a fruit stand, 
you wanted to sell the world's best apples. You, you have the best apples in the world. And so you go to sell them and then you say, you know, what would be a really good name for my fruit sin. Let's name it apple. Well, everybody refers to the fruit apples as apples. And so just by its nature, it's not really identifying your business or what you're doing. It's just describing what you're selling and everybody uses that terminology. So you can't get a trademark on a well-used term for what the product or the service you're providing. Now, if you want to go sell consumer goods and you want to sell smartphones and the computers and that, you want to name your work or your company Apple, by all means, because it has nothing to do with what you're selling or the services you're providing. So those are kind of the two reasons, confusingly similar with what the somebody else's trademark that's already out there, or you're merely descriptive. Last one is patents. Patents, you're going to have kind of a couple different criteria that you're going to consider for when they're looking as to whether or not you should be issued a patent. One is called novelty. The other one is called obviousness. Novelty is basically, has anybody else previously invented this? Somebody else has already previously invented this. You can't get a patent on something that's already been invented. Obviousness is a bit different. Obviousness means, well, okay, not one person has invented this, but if you were to take two or more things that are already out there, you're just kind of putting those two things together. You're really not adding anything new. You're just combining a couple of things. And therefore, if it would have been an obvious combination, you're not really adding anything unique or different. And so it wouldn't be patentable. So those are kind of when you're looking at copyrights, just don't copy anybody. Trademark, you can't be confusingly similar with what's out there. And you can't just describe what you're selling. And patents, you have to invent it. And it can't be an obvious, very obvious combination of a couple of things already out there. One of the things that you think about whenever you file a trademark is you tell them kind of what categories you're going to be using it in, what kinds of goods or services, what types of products or services. And so if you think of an example, Nike has a trademark for athletic wear, sports gear, and apparel, because that's what they sell. They don't sell automobiles. So theoretically, you could go get Nike Automo or Automotive as a trademark because they don't do anything of that now. You may or may not want to go do that. Nike is pretty famous. They have a lot of money, but you could decide for yourself. I'll give you caveat that this is general advice, not specific legal advice. Don't take anything that I say as an actual legal advice specific. I just give my caveat so nobody comes and gets mad at me. What generally break down is when you start to use a trademark, you have some inherent rights, but they're limited to your specific geographic location that you're actually using that for. So make up an example. Let's say you started at Dara St. John's Pizza. St. John's, but Sarah St. John's pizza, and you started in Chicago. You're the first person to start using it. You use it in Chicago. You've been there for 20 years. And then somebody went and registered a trademark for the same, you know, Sarah St. John's pizza for everything else. Well, you can keep using it in Chicago because you were the first to use it. You can, you have the inherent rights to keep using it for the geographic location that you're using it in. But what it does is it boxes you out from ever expanding out. In other words, you can stay in Chicago, keep selling pizza. You can't start a franchise. You can't start either it's a place in another, you know, in Los Angeles or wherever you want to go or New York or wherever is a good place to start pizza. And so that's really probably in the same sense where you'd be out with the, the other uh, competitor. If you were to file a trademark first, you would have the rights to it. You could block other people potentially from getting that or be able to use it. But for the person that was started using it before you, they would be able to continue to use it in their geographic location. And theoretically you would be able to use it in their geographic location something called snap legal where people can do these different things on their own the copyright trademark patent and it's more affordable that way i guess which is interesting and unique because i don't know many places that do that I recommend doing an attorney they're going to give you the best coverage they're going to have the most expertise they're going to give you the best guidance and so really that and, and i still hold truly in the law firm i usually recommend hey if you have if it's within your budget you're better to have an attorney do it you're going to have the best coverage and the best protection with that said, I also, I've done several startups of my own. I get it. Sometimes if you're early on, you have more things to spend money on than money to spend. Budgets are very tight. And, you know, so we started kind of snap legal to say, well, you know, we still stand by as better get an attorney, but sometimes it's one of those who's better than nothing. In other words, you're better to get something in place as you're growing. I'd rather you have something in place. And so we set up snap legal to give the best outcome for those that are doing a DIY, if they don't have a, you know, a lot of budget and to do it, that it gives them the best ability to do it on their own. If they don't have that, if the attorney, now attorneys going to add a lot more experience and a lot of background. So the answer would be, is if you had the budget, I would still do the attorney because they're going to give it, whether it's us or anybody else, they're going to give a better outcome, better protection. But if you don't have the budget, then I would do the, the DIY option or the snap legal way option because it gives you kind of protection than you'd otherwise have had you not filed it. More protection, I guess you mean like 
because when you're doing it yourself, you might miss something or trademarks. We talked about categories. So let's say you were doing a podcast and I'm just making it up. So may or may not be true, but let's say you did, you had multiple services. One is you did a podcast. Another is you sold books and you sold, you know, training courses and you also sold swag, you know, you sold t-shirts or you sold hats. And you are also thinking about doing the service where you help other people do a podcast and you were also doing webinars. And so you had a whole bunch of things going and you really say, well, is this really, I need, need to do frugal preneur for my podcast. And you don't think about all those other goods and services. Then you, you do get a trademark and it's limited for that specific purpose. And then you don't get covers for all those other things you're doing. So it leaves you a lot of narrow protection. Another one that sometimes people won't think about is you are doing a, if, if you're currently using your, tra or your trademark in commerce, meaning you're currently using it as part of your brand, then you have to provide specimens. We give you as good a guidance, but it, it is a more nuanced thing as to how you show that you're using in commerce and meet those requirements. And so sometimes you'll get more likelihood of rejection just because you don't realize, you know, even though you get as much, we give you as much trade as you can, you don't realize the things that you don't know because you don't think they're important or it's not a big deal. And so you don't file it even or how you should. So. It's kind of infusing some of those and it helps you to attorneys that generally help you to avoid some of those issues. They also give you that broader coverage of, Hey, have you done, what are all you doing with your brand? Let's make sure to get that covered. So that's kind of the trade off. There's snap legal set up to help you as best they can, but it doesn't replace some an attorney with an experience. So it's kind of that balance of if you're looking for something you, you know, if you can with where your budget is, we want to make sure you can get the protection you're able to. And then when you have the budget use an attorney because they're going to help you or get you broader protection and, and, and avoid some of those issues. You can kind of think of it as, for example, you maybe you need to fix your dishwasher or your fridge. So you look up on YouTube, how to do it and you do it yourself versus hiring someone to come out and do it. And I'm just going to go file it. I have no idea what I'm doing and don't even bother looking at YouTube and that's don't do that. That's some cursed idea. But then you say, you know, <laughs> I always look at it as kind of, let's say you take it one more example. Let's say you're building a home. And you can go look up on YouTube. You can build a home now. Your home may not be with you exactly what you want. It may not, you know, have to be up to code, but it would be a home that you would have a shelter. And is it better to have a shelter in place to roof over your head, even if you have to build it yourself? Yeah, it's better than sleeping out in the cold. Now, if you're to go hire an attorney that, you know, the builder in that case, you know, home builder that does it every day, they know how to build a home. You're going to get a better overall product. And so you kind of take it in stages. Doing nothing is, is the worst. Doing something that, you know, is on your own, you're not going to get as nice of a home as what you then do if you do a builder, but it gives you a roof over your head. And then to the ability that it's been turning, you know, you have the budget or a builder, go hire a builder that gives you the best or best overall outcome. It's a good um, comparison. I think that'll help people kind of understand. <laughs> so, well, I really appreciate your time today. You answered a lot of questions and went over a lot of things and hopefully it'll, I know it's cleared some things up for me and I'm sure it will for listeners as well and of course they can find you at um miller ipl.com yeah, is that correct it's an easier one to remember law with miller all one word dot com miller ipl is just a shortened version it's miller is the law firm i is intellectual property p is in, or i is intellectual p is in property l is in law so miller ipl.com is a shorter one oh, cool. or just go to law with miller the other way, if people are having more questions, if they listen, then they say, oh, what about this? Or I don't know about this or my circumstance is different. We offer free strategy meetings. And so we sit down free of charge, take 15, 20 minutes, kind of walk through what you have, give you some ideas, some guidance, help you get a roadmap. And that's all free. So you just go to strategymeeting.com and that leads right to my calendar, gives you an ability to grab some time with me and chat. So that's another good way to go to strategymeeting.com as well. Okay. Wow. I might have to do that. That's a good domain name too. I bet it was maybe a pretty penny. No, I get the question this all the time. And strategy <laughs> session was like it's incredibly expensive. And what this I bought it a little while. Oh, and okay. I'm like, well, I don't really want to spend several thousand dollars on strategy session. So I actually found strategy meeting and it was a re relatively inexpensive one. I'm like, that's just as good. It's I don't really expensive. So probably it would be more expensive today. I was lucky enough when the, nobody they hadn't started charging that nearly as much for that one when I went to buy it. But it, it works that way. <laughs> It's easy for people to remember. I also have show notes with links to everything at thesarahstjohn.com forward slash Devin Miller. Well, thank you so much for your time today. Absolutely. It was a blast to be on. I appreciate you having me.